Hello. I'm happy to be back. I'm going to do an update on my talk from two years ago, which was about web uh, evolution of standards, how things get better on the web. Uh, and I'll update you on some of the things that are getting better. Two years ago, I was optimistic about something. I, I started by pointing to over 5 billion people that will be coming on, online uh, around the world, often using a smartphone and not anything like this device. At the time, I was talking in terms of things like Firefox OS. I do believe still that we all deserve a better web, but things have happened since 2013. Firefox OS, to be honest, uh, has not got traction. Tizen, <laughs> you'll notice the price difference. Um, Tizen has not got traction. Um, it's hard to make another OS now that Apple has the high end and Android has everything else. We knew this when we started Firefox OS when I was at Mozilla. We, we knew it would only come in at the lower end of the market. We knew it would be important to get there soon, and we knew apps were required. So uh, we came in at the low end of the market, perhaps too low. Uh, we came in soon, but we could have been sooner. There was some uh, warming up at Mozilla to get into the, the process uh, of actually doing a mobile operating system, which was hard. Uh, and we didn't have apps. Apps are the key, and unfortunately, even if you can cross-compile an app from C++ to JavaScript, which we did, and we got some games that way, uh, you won't get apps without the permission of the app's owner. For instance, WhatsApp, very important app Facebook owns. I met Jan Koom in 2013, and I said, we need your app. And he said, I don't do version 1.0 operating systems. Come back when you have some users. And um, I said, I can't get users without your app. <laughs> so. In a nutshell, I think that was the problem for Firefox OS. Uh, you know, everything else that might have been better didn't, didn't really harm it as much as that lack of apps, critical apps. Uh, and so people talk about, oh, mobile is replacing desktop, and, and the mobile web is, is dying, and the, you know, it's all apps. Well, that's, that's clearly false. How many of you browse your home screens and curate your apps and make sure that you, you have thousands of apps you, you download and, and keep up to date? I don't do it. After the fourth page, I, I get kind of sick of it. Uh, I have apps I should remove, but I'm not sure if I'll miss them. And we know that the app stores are not making uh, a lot of money for developers except for the ones who make the hit apps. And so it's a content business. It's a hit and miss business like the movie business, uh, like the game business. And games are an important app category. Uh, that means the web is, is still important economically. The web has the reach. The web has the so-called long tail, which is really a different tail for each of you. Uh, we all overlap in some common popular sites. Uh, we might go to the BBC or, or uh, another news site, but we have a lot of choices on the web. And no one needs permission to get into the web store. There is no web store. So smartphones and the web are co-evolving. And that's a, a cause for, in my view, optimism, because we have this wonderful hardware, we have the web, there's no reason we should not have the best of both. There was some concern early this year when Flipkart, the number one e-commerce site in India, took down its mobile website. It turned out they were working secretly with Google to build a progressive web app, and they're back. And the neat thing about this is, if I can um, break to my browser window here, is they did a little homage to something I spoke about two years ago here, the extensible web manifesto, right there on the Flipkart technical blog. So, you know, I don't think Google told them to do that. They, they're on board with that EWM, and so am I, and that was, that was a good sign. So Flipkart is back, and it's, you know, targeting Chrome and Android, using service workers, but these are good innovations. I think these are generally for the best, and they need to be used as well as standardized. Um, we'll talk about that later in the talk. There it is, Flipkart. So EWM for the win. And I think this will be the way you'll see the web evolve most rapidly. No big standards like back in the day when SVG was a giant spec under construction. Uh, rather smaller specifications, incremental specifications, things that can be polyfilled. Um, so, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong with this picture? Well, nothing except um, there are walled gardens, uh, namely Apple and the Google Play Store and you know, some Android forks in Asia. Security is an ongoing problem. Guaranteed employment for our grandchildren. 
if they don't program anything else, no robots, they'll work on security. It'll be great. Robot security. But you know, the, on the upside, the web is not going away. Web developers, I think, have it better than ever. Tell me if I'm wrong. Is, is anything getting worse for you as a web developer, or is it always better? Is it always Candyland and Chrome and even Firefox and now Edge? I, I know it's good, but the web is a mess. And, and I'm going to talk about this frankly because the web has to be a mess because of the way it grows. It's like, it's like an aquarium or an ecosystem. Um, you can't necessarily get the good new life forms without keeping other forms around so they can stand on them or feed on them or something. Um, so you don't break compatibility intentionally uh, unless it was some early thing you, you prematurely standardized and that barely got adopted and then you can fix it really fast and, and, and then try to stick to that revised standard. That happens now and then, but mainly you don't break anything, which means the web gets bigger in its total compatibility matrix, this total set of specifications, which makes it harder to implement browsers over time. Uh, and that could lead to a, a problem at some point, but it's not a problem yet. Um, and it turns out you do break compatibility on the scale of decades. Uh, not always intentionally, you just, the content from the 90s that depended on spacer GIFs, I think I'm saying that right, and table layout before it was standardized as part of CSS, doesn't look right if you go to the web archive that compatibility doesn't matter apart from the web archive because nobody writing modern content uses space or GIFs. So if you go back far enough into the 70s, you, you may, those of you who are as old as I am, may remember um, there was a certain teen idol named Leif Garrett, and I'm, I'm only mentioning Leif because of his first name. He was the Bieber of his day. Um, things didn't go too well later for him. I hope he's doing better. Um, he has a nice beard, so does Douglas. And Douglas has created Project Safe, spelled like Leif but with an S, as a pun on safety. Uh, I don't think Doug was ever a teen idol, though he might have been in a band once. Um, I miss Doug. Doug left ECMA TC39, I think uh, in 2014, early on, to do research at PayPal. He, he was mad at, at us for slipping ES6 one more time, six month slip on the schedule. He, he got fed up with that. He also was upset with the IETF, which was trying to re-standardize JSON and change it. And as Doug wisely wrote in his original JSON RFC, uh, JSON will never change. It's, it's, it's frozen for all time. I'm not sure what's happened with that IETF effort. Anyway, Doug went into the research department of PayPal to create Project Safe, which is a very um, researchy project. Uh, it uses Node.js and Qt and a crypto library, and it tries to build a, a smaller sort of browser engine uh, for a, a safer, smaller web. Uh, that's because Doug is a minimalist. Here's some nice minimalism. Um, it's McCracken, Judd, and um, yeah. That's, that's what Doug likes. The web is not minimalist. The, the problem for... Um, and this is a deep problem. The problem for research projects like Doug's is that while they may actually be interesting new systems, they have to cope with the reality of the web. They have to get onto the web somehow. And if, if the way they get onto the web breaks their security properties, it won't work. Rob Pike, uh, before he went to Google, wrote a, a paper um, for Usenet, Usenix, I think, called Systems Software Research is Irrelevant. It's a very good paper. Uh, he talks about why he thinks sort of uh, operating system research went into decline after Unix. And one of the reasons was Unix, you know, Linux. Um, another one was the PC and the commodification of the computer so that your grandma uses it. Um, and there were other reasons he adduced for why system software research has, had gone into a sort of stagnant period. Now, he, he made some very interesting insights that I won't dwell on, like, this has led to academic researchers becoming bean counters and doing you know, measurement and statistics and phenomenology, not, not actually designing new systems. And he explicitly says system design is an art. It's not a science, otherwise we probably could make robots do it. So uh, I think he's right. I think we're still in sort of a lull. Unix has reached a, a low uh, 
energy spot in the continuum that is a very good place for operating systems to be. People are doing unikernels where they shrink their program to have just the system calls it needs without an expensive system call trap, and they're running them in hypervisors in the cloud, but it's still Unix. Unix is immortal. I remember reading uh, John Lyon's Unix version 6, six edition commentary um, back when I was small and thin, and it was great. It was beautiful. It was like uh, this system call table from version 6. You have like the no op, the exit call, fork, read, write, open, close, wait, create, which Ken Thompson said he would have spelled with an E at the end if he had to do it over again. That's the one change Ken would have made to Unix was to fix the spelling of create. Um, pretty minimal. And when you minimize, there's less to get wrong, or if you get something wrong, it's in what you left out. It's, it's one of those big picture things. Um, I showed this at Brooklyn JS uh, just three weeks ago. Ryan Dahl happened to be there because I know Ryan loves Unix, and I was sort of um, vibing off Ryan. Uh, I think he's doing software again, not just art. So I hope he does something really awesome like Node again. But the web is not Unix. The web is not minimal like that. It's not low level. Of course, it has to be safer, but even when I did JavaScript and there was just document.open, document.write, there was no inner HTML, there was no create element, um, you know, it was more maximal than Unix. It was not minimal. Um, and it was funky. So now I'm going to tell you what's going on in the standards body because we're trying to make it less funky. And I'll, I'll get to the punchline. But first, the news about the, the market and the players of the standards body is that, the, that they've changed chairs. Um, Google is now Microsoft. They are, whether they mean to or not, they're acting like Microsoft did back eight or 10 years ago, exactly like it. Like, oh, it's hard to implement this ES6 feature in V8, let's change it, or we don't want to implement it, or um, I, I can't do it. And, <laughs> and Microsoft is the fair dealer. They're saying, we did it, um, and the standard's done, by the way. We all agreed to it, including you. And Apple, who sends one person at most, sometimes zero, the Apple, Apple dude is like, we did it not a problem. Uh, so Apple's still Apple. They're still too, too good for the room. They come late. They, they're, they're coming at the Hollywood party, like the, the new hot star at, at midnight saying, start the party after the booze is all gone. Um, but Microsoft is Mozilla. And I said this at Brooklyn JS, and I knew something was coming, which came, which is Chakra, Chakra Core open sourcing. So I knew that was going to happen. I told them to do it. I think they listened to me. That was good. Um, and, and Microsoft has to do that. They're in some ways like Mozilla with Firefox OS. They don't have a mobile operating system. They have very small footprint on smartphones at that level. Uh, they have apps. Of course, uh, Excel or Office is doing great, and they've ported apps, and they're doing more apps for you know, iPads and iPhones as well as Android. Uh, but they, they have to, I think, play fair. They want to, too. I'm not saying that they're only doing it because they're opportunists. Uh, but they have to serve their, their shareholders' interests. And, and those two converge when you're in the sort of back position they're in now on mobile web. So they're working earnestly on JavaScript, and they're completely on board with WebAssembly, too, which is good news. I'll talk a little bit about a few uh, things very briefly. You'll have to read the GitHub to follow them. And, and they change all the time, so I don't want to tell you something that isn't true in a week. But um, if you look at... Um, there's Rob Pike's paper. Um, you look at Yehuda Katz's um, private data proposal um, with Alan Weiris Brock. This is a, a proposal from Alan and Yehuda. Some people reacted badly to this. I don't know if you can see. It, it uses, uh, uses hash for uh, a, a special sort of sigil to prefix private data. And that allows you to reference the private data unambiguously inside methods and classes. There's no confusion between the public fields of this and the private data. This may change, and some people uh, on Twitter didn't like the extra use of hash, which is one of the few characters not used in JavaScript in the uh, sort of ASCII 128-bit uh, uh, character set. Not, not, uh, not yet used, so it's very coveted. People are afraid to use it because they might want it for something else. They might want it for macros later or something. But um, if it's worth it, we'll use it. Private data seems worth it. I don't know if people here have strong feelings about this. I hope no one's um, seething about this. If you are, um, tweet at Yehuda. 
<laughs> he loves it. Um, and you know, it, it's early, it'll evolve, we'll get it right. We won't standardize it without testing on users. The other thing Yehuda is pushing, because he's a Rubyist uh, of renown, is a decorator proposal that is, is nice in that it allows sort of um, runtime metaprogramming through uh, special at, another sigil, at prefix names that do things like make read-only uh, attribute out of your property or your method. Uh, you can see at read-only before the name method of this person's, uh, person class's name method. And it's all built on the reflection uh, and the metaprogramming facilities in ES6 and ES5. Um, so that might happen too. But you know, ES7 2016, ES8 2017, these are going to be uh, smaller specifications. It's like when, when Firefox followed Chrome onto the every six weeks rapid release waterfall. Um, the, you know, the, the first release or so was a nothing burger. There wasn't anything there. Um, it was fine because it let the pipe get filled again and, and things are rolling now. And I think a lot of software is going to a uh, six week waterfall like Ember, I believe is. Um, okay, so when I had this talk at Brooklyn JS, it got picked up, Zeigenvector picked it up and this was a very popular tweet and it said that it was a rare insight into the goings on on Mount Olympus. And, and the cool thing is, they were projecting on a wall, so all that stuff about Yehuda and Alan's private data and decorator proposals got kind of clipped, and everybody just saw that Google is Microsoft, Microsoft is Mozilla, and Apple is Apple. And um, some people were amused, some people actually understood what I meant even before Chakra Core open sourced, and the Microsoft guys were, were really enjoying it. I hope that it keeps them behaving well. And Mozilla is still there, Dave Herman is, is still there for Mozilla, and other Mozillans show up sometimes. Uh, so more Mozilla the merrier, right? Uh, but Microsoft has market power on PCs with Edge and IE. So this is, this is a good ch change. I think this is a positive step. I mean, I remember arguing with Chris Wilson when he worked for Microsoft, not Google. Uh, and he was saying, oh, it's too hard. We can't implement it. We don't want to. That's what Google's doing now. Uh, <laughs> so on to WebAssembly. So WebAssembly <clears throat> came about, I would say, directly because of ASM.js. ASM.js was a research project at Mozilla that was inspired by Alon Zakai's Imscripten compiler, which is based on LLVM, takes C++ or C, turns it into fast JavaScript. And Alon, just by uh, good engineering, had sort of deduced the, the type system that is ASM.js, and then Dave Herman helped formalize it, and Luke Wagner of the SpiderMonkey team uh, did an amazing job writing a, a very fast compiler that turns it into super fast machine code with safety, with the same kind of, you can't be pwned, you can't have an out of bounds uh, pointer store, you can't have a buffer overrun safety that, that Pinnacle has, a portable native client. And so at some point, I think it was early this year, the V8 team and the Pinnacle team, I'm gonna dish the dirt, met at Google, I, second hand, maybe not be true, I heard there was blood on the ground afterwards. The V8 team was victorious, they said, look, this is not gonna work, Pinnacle has a big runtime, a Pepper API that maps tightly to Chromium Blink and the operating system. Uh, meanwhile, ASM.js is coming up and the Mozilla guys want to do a new syntax for it. And that syntax is WebAssembly. So don't let anybody tell you otherwise, the genesis of WebAssembly is ASM.js. The Pinnacle work was helpful in exploring a larger space to do with safe code, how safe portable code might work. But the direct lineage is from ASM.js. Uh, Tim mentioned he had something like ASM in his talk, but he had GoTo main. There's no GoTo in ASM. Uh, GoTo's, uh, maybe that's a safe GoTo, I don't know Tim's language, but in, in, in general, in bytecode, GoTo's make trouble because they can make your flow graph have knots and twists in it and be irreducible, uh, computer scientists say. So the great thing about WebAssembly is it's just another syntax for JavaScript at first. In fact, it's only for the ASM.js subset but it can evolve separately once all the browsers support the syntax. Uh, all the uh, browser implementers are on board. They're doing it right, they're, they're specifying it with um, a nice ML definitional interpreter. Um, Andreas Rosberg, who I know on the VA team, loves ML, so he's having fun writing that. It gives him a break from writing C++ and JavaScript, where I hear he pounds his desk and curses. Um, Imscripten is already supporting it, and there's some other experimental projects you can find uh, in the github.com WebAssembly account, there are many repositories there. I'll show you a few. 
and all the engines are implementing it, I think uh, V8 is already uh, ahead in implementing a decoder for the binary abstract syntax code, the bit code of WebAssembly. Um, SpiderMonkey's doing it, I think Chakra's doing it, as they announced when they said they were open sourcing. Uh, what does WebAssembly look like? It's really hard to visualize a bunch of, you know, bits, frequency encoded bits. There is a syntax, it looks like Lisp, that's not meant for downloading because it would be as verbose as JavaScript or more so. And a lot of the win comes from having a very concise syntax. This is for view source. This solves the problem of, I have some WebAssembly, I want to look at it and see what it does. What language can I render it in? You could try to raise it back up to JavaScript or C++ or whatever language it came from, but it's, it's, it's actually nicer to have a common syntax, which is an S expression syntax and you can read here a very simple program. This is on the, uh, on the GitHub for um, one of the projects, one of the repos um, at WebAssembly. In fact, I can show you that very quickly. Let me see if I can get there. Um, here's the V8 native prototype. It's part of um, github.com WebAssembly V8 hyphen native hyphen prototype. This is Alon Zakai's binary N, I guess uh, binary encoding uh, for WebAssembly. And he has uh, a little add program here. It uses asm.js. You can see the, the bitwise or zeros to cast those parameters to integers, to type them as integers. And uh, the return value is also cast to an integer the same way. And that asm.js is co-expressive with the S expression version here that you see, the one I had in my slide. So that's cool. Um, we have uh, a lot to look forward to in WebAssembly, and I think WebAssembly is Unix in the sense that it is that simple kernel. It is that minimal system call table. It's 32 and 64 bit integers and floats, and different views of memory that allow you to do the uint8 and int8 and int16, uint16. That um, does mean 64 bit ints are coming to JavaScript, but WebAssembly will have them all. It has simd because that's also in JavaScript or coming to JavaScript, but it's a very safe but low-level version of your machine, analogous to Unix, but not equivalent to Unix. So um, in seeking that simplicity, I think uh, we found it with WebAssembly, and I think it will, it, if it gets out there and becomes what everyone targets with their cross-compiled game code and their code that must run with definite performance, where performance is critical, you have to get to the metal, then I think it will be immortal, it will be in the hardware. Um, and it will be standardized. People always want standardization. What they don't want is premature standardization, as I showed last time, um, because um, then you end up changing the standards behind people's backs. So we're not going to do that. Uh, just to give you demos about how ASM.js is actually already paving the way for WebAssembly, even though WebAssembly is not supported, you can polyfill a decoder for it, and you can ship fewer bits because it is more compressed, it compresses better, than ASM.js, but it turns out uh, game developers are already doing um, games like on Facebook, I'll show one. And, uh, this is a serious uh, game and there are many like these coming online now. This is based on ASM.js deployed on Facebook. There's no um, plugin required and it's some kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> hobbits versus orcs thing. I, I played this at Brooklyn JS and I lost and, and uh, Brian Loves Words uh, made fun of me and he said, oh no, the web lost to native. <laughs> it, was, it was cruel. Uh, I haven't practiced this, but let's see. Press anywhere to continue. All right, click. All right, regroup. We need to settle a town. Okay, elixirs, build. Who plays this kind of game? I don't, obviously. I don't let my kids, so yeah, okay. I'm going to build some elixirs. Thank you. Check. All right, can we attack? Please let us attack. Anywhere to continue, right? Build. Army school, you can't go into battle without an army school, okay? Skip, no, yes. Oh, the king is telling me something, all right. Thanks a lot, attack. Here's where I'm gonna have problems because I don't think I built enough. I need to build more weapons. Um, all right, attack. I only have a few guys though here, let's see who they are. Um, Oh, there they go. And I have, I have like one weapon here. Alright. I'm winning. 
I better quit while I'm ahead. All right, let me do something uh, bold. Um, I'm gonna start plain old Firefox mainline, see how this works. All right, good. The good thing about this game is it's a zombie game, but I don't have to do anything um, too violent because I have sentry chickens. And they have machine guns on their back. I'm very fond of them. They, um, they, they, they do a good job taking care of your zombie problem if you have a farm and there are zombies, so you should get some country chickens. Sometimes the machine guns overheat and they explode, though. It's a cloud of feathers. It's very sad. Uh, but you can respawn them. Um, and for some reason, the zombies are carrying wads of cash. Fat stacks of cash. I don't know why. They're, they're prepared for a night out, so... Oh, I don't want to hurt him. Uh, I'll let the chickens do it. Go, chickens. There's also, besides, um, there's more money, gotta get that. There's also some uh, golden pigs you can shoot. There's a golden pig there, and you get money. Oh, and there's this big guy, he's, he's trouble. So you, I will use grenades. Okay, anyway, Asm.js and Unity today announced they are supporting what they call the WebGL target, which is WebGL, Asm.js, Web Audio as a first-class target, there's no more preview label on it. All their games can be compiled to it. All their licensees can press a button and produce web games. And there's a zombie chewing on me. And so with that, I will stop. Uh, I'm glad I stopped. <laughs> I've been saying this since 2010, and it's still true. Um, I said it then because Dart was coming out, and people were like, oh, Dart's going to kill JavaScript. Nope. Always bet on JS. Thank you very much.